Well, hello and welcome back to Slightly Foxed and the 40th edition of the podcast. My name is Philippa Lamb and Foxed editors Gail Perkis and Hazelwood are both joining remotely this time. Hello, both. Hi, good morning. Now, this month we're digging uh, in a rather more agricultural sense than usual and we're going to be finding out about a writer who spent much of his life working on a farm in Suffolk. He's the author of one of Slightly Fox's latest limited edition hardbacks and he's the father of the world-famous BBC war correspondent Martin Bell and actually Martin has uh, written the preface to the book. Before we get to that though, Gail, Hazel, how is everything at Hoxton Square? Well, we're in the process of getting the spring issue out so the office is a hive of activity we're also we've got a lovely book coming out on the 1st of March Flora Thompson's Lark Cries which is a a lovely actually companion to Adrian Bell's books because they describe the agricultural scene in the 1880s before the changes of the 20th century. Yes well I've been sort of holed up reading slightly foxed editions the series that we reissue and um well one reads a lot of books before finding one (laughs) um (laughs) but it is interesting you know how you can tell pretty quickly really from the beginning of a book whether it's going to be a goer or not you know whether it's got that kind of individual voice that that you're looking for that sort of draws you in so you think you found a couple of gems do you hazel well not 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 yet immediately i mean we're pretty well booked up for the next year or so but we like to keep well ahead because, of course, one has to get permissions to do all these things. Yeah, of course, interesting. And nothing if not organised at Fox, that's for sure. Now, our subject today is the writer, columnist, farmer and founder of that fiendish brain teaser, The Times Cryptic Crossword, Adrian Bell. And our guest, Richard Hawking, is perhaps his greatest champion. Richard, hello. Hello, nice to be on. Now, you're joining us from work, I think, aren't you? I am. I'm currently standing in a, a book cupboard just off the English department. Um, so you may well hear some noises from children as they exchange classes a bit later on. So as everyone will have worked out by now, Richard is a teacher and we've grabbed him on his lunchtime break. Um, we're very, very glad to have you, Richard. Thanks so much for being with us. Now, you're chairman of the Adrian Bell Society, aren't you? I think obviously author of a book about him called At the Field's Edge and now this new book for Slightly Fox, A Countryman's Winter Notebook. I think that draws on his newspaper column, doesn't it, that he wrote for many years? Yes, it does. It was a column he wrote for the Eastern Daily Press from 1950 until 1980. And he had written approximately 1,500 essays for that newspaper. And those essays, very few of them have ever been republished again. And it was only after I'd written my first book, which was called At the Field's Edge, which was really about his contemporary environmental relevance that I discovered all these other articles and realised that there was a wealth of material that needed to be given to a wider audience. I just need to ask, can I hear a dog snore? Yes, that's what I thought yes, I, I could know, hear. It's Chudley, I'm afraid. He's decided to have a frolic on the <laughs> carpet. Oh, I thought it was my stomach. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was listening. We're recording this remotely, I should say to everyone. I just said this very strange noise. Um, sorry, Gail. I should say at this point, full transparency, that Gail and Hazel know a lot more about Adrian Bell's work than I do. I've read the first couple of his books. I am thoroughly enjoying them. Well, I was going to ask how Richard first came across Adrian Bell. I grew up on a farm in Somerset, and my father was a farmer from around about 1940 to um, when he passed away in 1997. So he lived at a similar time to Adrian Bell, and he also farmed in a similar way to Adrian Bell. It was a small, mixed farm. He had a few cattle, he had chickens, he grew potatoes, he grew wheat. And you know what it can be like when you get a bit older, you start to perhaps appreciate your youth a little bit more and and the the opportunities you had. And I realised growing up on a farm was a wonderful thing to have done. And it was after that that I discovered Adrian Bell's writing. And it was a book called Men in the Fields, which I discovered on a rainy November afternoon in in Hay on Wye. And as soon as I picked it up and opened the book and read the opening few pages, I was immediately transported back to the time in which my father was farming and perhaps some of the stories that I didn't have the opportunity to ask him, I found in Adrian Bell's words. Like with anything, particularly music or something like that, you go back to the start, you think, okay, I want what their debut. So I bought an old battered copy of Corduroy. I read that and, and that was the most amazing book 
that I'd read about farming, but it was also the poetic prose style that he chose to write that book in, which really drew me to it. Mm. It's very sort of quiet, isn't it? The way he kind of builds up the detail. It seems like, you know, some sort of old master painting almost. Well, very much so. And he was, Adrian Bell was very much influenced by painters. And in many ways, I think he wanted to capture those little moments throughout Corduroy. And you've got to bear in mind, he was writing Corduroy around about 10 years after the experiences that he describes in the book. So those moments became slightly more distilled. I mean, Rich, we're talking about this book. I wonder whether we should explain to people who don't know it, what it's about. It's set in 1920, isn't it? That's right. When Adrian Bell, he grew up in London. His father was uh, an editor for the, The Observer. And he went to Uppingham School, which was a bit like Eton, really. But he really didn't like Uppingham. And he was sort of led towards maybe a career in a city. But he decided that wasn't for him. So he got his father to pay for him to be apprenticed on a farm in Suffolk. And he stayed with someone called Vic Savage in a place called Hundon. And he was there for a year becoming an apprentice farmer and it was during that time that he realised that his true vocation was to become a farmer rather than working in the city. So his experiences that he lived through in Corduroy was one that he revisited after he had to quit farming because it wasn't economically sustainable anymore. Um, I think he wrote Corduroy, didn't he, during the period that he describes in his third book, The Cherry Tree, and that's how he got in touch with his wife because she was a fan of the book. Was yeah, that, so was he, that right, Richard? Yeah, well, so when he finished farming in Suffolk in about 1928, he then moved back to Sudbury to live with his mother and he wasn't sure about what he wanted to do and it was during that time that he was acquainted with Edmund Blunden who wrote The Undertones of War and it was Edmund Blunden who said to Adrian Bell you should write about what you know and that's what led him to write the trilogy. So he wrote Corduroy in 1928 and then the other two books in the subsequent years and I think it was during the final book where he met his wife Marjorie. That's when he moved out of home and started to go on the route of becoming a writer. I suppose I, I'm interested to hear about why the work has endured and how relevant it is now but I, I must say he what did strike me when I first, you know, started on Corduroy was what an unlikely farmer Adrian Bell was. I mean, he came from, as you say, public schoolboy, from this arty literary family in Chelsea. His family must have been amazed when he made this decision, weren't they? I think they were very surprised. But you've got to bear in mind that at that time he was having lots of bad migraines. He was struggling with his health a little bit. So there was a sense that he needed to perhaps go and get some fresh air and maybe have a slightly more practical existence. I think he very much wanted a very different type of life. So for them, it was a surprise. But in some ways, I think when he then took to farming in the way that he did, they weren't particularly surprised that he did that. And eventually they came to live with him in Suffolk themselves. Because in, in Cordra, he records, doesn't he, when he first arrives and there's a shoot going on in the farm and after it's over, they all go back for supper and a lot of people assume that he's an invalid and he's come there for his health rather than, than actually to become an apprentice. Exactly, and he does actually write, it has been a salutary shock to me having just left a posh school at the age of 18 and gone on to farm to find myself equated with the village idiot. Here my education <laughs> counted oh, for nothing and most of it was nothing. I could have gone to Cambridge and be regarded as a brain, but here I was set to turn a handle. It was a sweating out of former notions. Because mm. he's pretty yes, useless, he... isn't he, obviously, at the start. I mean, the most basic labourer knows a lot more than him. And it, it's really quite funny reading about the humility. And he writes with humility, doesn't he, about just how ignorant he is. Oh, very much so. But I think what struck him is he wanted to be a poet when he was younger. And he loved Hardy, particularly loved Wordsworth. But when he was working working with these people that perhaps hadn't read Wordsworth, hadn't read Hardy, weren't familiar with that culture that he grew up with, he started to realise how out 
of sync that really was with the reality of it. So it's that sort of jarring of his own literary experience with his practical experience that really led him to think, actually, what I've read and what I understand is not right, and actually I want to go to a, for a more practical experience. He says a, a lovely thing, doesn't he, about um, a farmer, and I can't quite remember it, the number of things that he has to keep in his brain all at the same time. Yes, and he, and he criticises, I think it was the Thomas Hardy's In the Breaking of Nations, where he talks that only a man harrowing clods, was the quote. And he takes issue with Hardy's betrayal of the ploughman and says, actually, all these things I've got to keep in my head in order to keep the furrow straight, in order mm. to make sure the horse is behaving and so on and so forth. And that's really where he... Re- it was. It's like an epiphany, I think, for him at that point. In, in the sequel to um, Corduroy, Silver Lay, he, he starts to run his own farm, doesn't he? A, a small farm not far away from where he's been an apprentice. Yeah, that's right. He moves to a farm just outside Hundon, which is a place called Stradishaw in Silverlay. And there he describes himself living on his own on the farm, trying to put into into practice all the things that he'd learnt with Vic Savage. So and he's only 21, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's 21. And he managed to persuade his father to put some money in and, and buy this farm. And he, I think he got a lady from the local village to come in and do his domestic chores for him. And that's how he lived his life for the next two or three years. And then the family turn up, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they do. That yes. made me laugh. This romantic idyll, they think it's going to be lovely. <laughs> yes. The reality is very different, I think, for them, particularly his mother, who saw herself as a very cultured person. He was used to the bright lights and the lifestyle of London. And beautifully dressed. She, yeah. was quite, um, she was quite sporting about it, though, wasn't she? She did get dug in. Oh, she certainly did get dug in, in a way which perhaps surprised Belle and and in many ways that's why the trilogy is so popular because it is about personal development about realization about challenging perhaps what you feel are the norms of your own life and and that's why I think people are so drawn to it and it has such universal appeal. If she starts to um well she decides to raise poultry doesn't she and um... (laughs) And make butter. Yes I've forgotten about the butter. You do do wonder to what extent she's sort of playing at it as well. Yeah slightly. Do you think because I got the feeling she was working quite hard. Admittedly, I I've literally only just read all this, but I was impressed with her because she was an arty yes. Chelsea lady. And there she is on this seriously muddy farm, you know, just really shocked by how primitive it all is. And she just gets straight down to it and, and kind of basically gets the family selling farm produce back to her neighbours in Chelsea, doesn't she? Which I, I thought was remarkably entrepreneurial. Yes, it does seem quite remarkable. In many ways, she was quite a dominating spirit. She obviously saw Belle as her little prodigy, really, in many ways, and, and probably trusted the fact that he was leading in this life and thought, actually... I will be led by his view of things. And I think that's why she came over and thought, "Okay, I'm going to make the most of this. And she does strike me as a character who would make the most of whatever she was thrown into. Yes, I love them arriving with their rather sort of posh Chelsea-type doormat, (laughs) which just became one sort of thick, mudded square. Just not up to the job at all, a proper mud in the country. I thought it was very funny when they moved in and the first thing his father did was get into his library and start unpacking his own books and the whole rest of the house is in total chaos and there's no means of lighting a fire or cooking anything to eat. And the first thing he does is unpack his books and I have to say it reminded me forcibly of my own very bookish husband the last time we moved house. <laughs> um, I <laughs> I mean, the other thing I love in Silver Lay is the sort of social life that goes on in the country. I mean, it's a very active society, isn't it? It's not just ploughing the fields and doing the head and ditching there's a lot of tennis parties and obviously the hunt and shoots yeah and again that surprised adrian bell i think quite a lot having come from london and perhaps in sharp contrast to his own experience at uppingham he saw a supportive engaged rural community where in some senses it was seen as fairly classless and i know it's perhaps idealized a little bit but everybody played their role be it a craftsman or be it a landowner or be it a farmer and he really appreciated the fact that these people were all interconnected for the benefit of the community as a whole 
It's because he's involved in, in the village school, isn't he? He goes to read the register one day, I remember. <laughs> yes. He does, and he, and, he, and he wanted to get involved in all aspects, I think, of Suffolk life. He was so enthused about what he'd moved to that he felt that it was up to him to try and make those connections himself. Mm. Yes, he talks about the old, I think it's the old generous sort of life of the countryside, which I suppose, as the Depression sort of took hold became less really that's very much in the cherry tree isn't it there's farmers going bankrupt and that um there's a sale isn't there of uh, um all the, the goods and chattels from a farm and everything is laid out in the field for the auctioneer to to sell off i mean it's it's heartbreaking really to read yeah that. and that's another reason why the trilogy is, is such an important one because he is writing about the change that he was witnessing in the countryside at that point. It's worth noting that he was writing those books in the early 1930s, which was 10 years on from the repeal of something called the Corn Act, which essentially took away a lot of the finance for farmers. So he'd seen a decade of farmers struggling economically. So when he was writing the trilogy, Mm. that was very clear in his mind and he could see that farming was actually starting to sort of fall apart and rural communities, which he loved, were starting to fragment as a result. Yes, there's a very heartbreaking bit where a farmer, his farm is repossessed and he sells his favourite cow Mm. to Adrian Bell and the farmer comes day after day just to stand by the gate and, and sort of look at her and says... Finally, I'd rather you had her than anybody else. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking. It is stuff, heartbreaking. It? it is poignant. And this is where not only does he meet his wife, we also see the impacts of the declining farming communities which he lived in. He met his wife just while he was writing Silver Lay in, I think, in 1931. They got engaged and they moved back to live with his mum, in Sudbury, which didn't last very long because uh, his mum was, how can we put it, not massively pleased that he'd got married. So they, oh. did go and re- the, uh, they did go and rent a cottage, I think, after about six months to ease the domestic tension. Uh, see, now I'm understanding that slight reservation I heard in your voice when you, we were talking about his mother earlier. From what I've read so far, she's portrayed very delightfully. I mean, he was obviously very fond of her, but it's from what you're saying, it sounds like she was a... Well, in some ways, a bit of a difficult one. Well, I think there's there's different interpretations. There's Adrian's interpretation, and there's there's also the biography of Adrian Bell by Anne Gander, who spent an inordinate amount of time researching documents to write his biography. And she is very critical of the mother, says dominant, overbearing. I don't necessarily get that through Adrian's words, but then no. maybe I get through Adrian's words that, that she's someone who wanted the best for Adrian and felt that she could provide it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other thing, I, I obviously the cherry tree has got its sad elements on the economic side, but the cameos that he gives of various traditional craftsmen. There's a wonderful portrait of a wagon maker called Mark Ashen, a man called Charlie Todd, who is the overseer of an enormous barn on a neighbouring farm. And they really give you an idea of the skills that were required in making wagons, making tools, building haystacks, keeping farm premises, keeping them going and organising them. Yes, in many ways, the rural craftsmen were probably one of the main influences, both in his writing, but also in his own reading. I know he was very fond of a writer called George Stewart, who also wrote under the pseudonym of George Bourne. And he was a rural craftsman born in the Victorian period and wrote into about 1920, something like that. And one of his favourite books, he reviewed it actually for the Times History Supplement, was a book called The Village Carpenter by someone called Walter Rose. And he was a fourth generation craftsman who was reflecting upon that heritage. Yes, there's some wonderful descriptions. This is one of the wagon maker and, you know, the sort of pride he took. There's a lovely bit where they go to choose the wood and he sort of rests his hand on the wood, you know, as if it if he could almost sort of feel it speaking. Yeah, and... that's that's a really interesting point, actually, because I, I was having a look at an anthology that Adrian Bell put together for Faber and Faber in 1935, so it was just after the Rural Trilogy. And in the introduction to this anthology called The Open Air, he writes very much about rural craftsmen. And I will just read you a little quote, because I think it highlights both his joy of the rural craftsmen, but also of rural community. The farmer will say that's a fine tree with a different meaning from the man in the street. He will pick it out for its long straight trunk and absence of low spreading branches. 
It is timber, and that is not so mercenary a view as it seems. Certainly it is utilitarian, but involved in a hereditary knowledge of the processes of timber. It is probably there is at least one wheelwright or village carpenter in his lineage, whereby the tree, in a sense, goes on living after it is felled, as a wagon or a plough, turning his earth or carrying his harvest. Mm -hmm. Wherever one touches this old country life, and whatever aspect, one is led back to that central common impulse in which use and beauty are one. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that I think Adrian died in 1980, didn't he? But his work has endured. I'd be interested to ask you how you'd encapsulate why that is, but also I know you think it's very relevant for now. Yes, I do. First and foremost, he was a wonderful writer. His writing, his prose style, is absolutely beautiful. He writes like a poet, he tries not to overword, and he tries to focus very much on specific images, a bit like a painter does. I think in terms of why he's becoming a little bit more popular in the 21st century is because he was talking about lots of things which impact now, particularly the way that we farm the land and how damaging industrial agriculture has been, the intensification of farming, the pesticides, the monocultures, and he could see that change in his lifetime and he was documenting that change not from the perspective of an academic, but from a perspective of someone who worked with the land himself. Yes, I mean, as you say, we talked about these issues on the podcast before, actually, in relation to other books, but this area, and it's Gail's area of expertise, I think, much more than mine, this, well, it, this reconnecting with the land, we talked about rewilding, that whole sense of the urban population now, starting to really understand about the importance of all that. It's part of that, isn't it? Yes, well, I, that comes out in the Countryman's Winter Notebook, and he writes about going to the local town, and this probably is in the 60s or early 70s, and he wants to buy a, a besom, and a besom basically is a broom made of a piece of wood and twigs bound onto the end of it, and it makes a perfectly good broom, and when it's finished with, it becomes firewood or gets put on the compost heap, and instead he, he sees in the hardware shop a, a fancy device for sweeping up leaves which costs a great deal more than a besom and of course once it ceases to work it doesn't rot down and go back into the landscape and I think there are little elements like that all the way through the articles in the Countryman's Winter Notebook recording those changes where you know supposedly improvements have been made but actually old-fashioned methods did just as well and, and were far more beneficial for and, the land. And so often, Gail, you've taught me something new. I never knew it was pronounced like that. <laughs> I always thought it was besom, but it's besom. <laughs> I think it is. But during the war, he went back to farming again, didn't he? Yes, that's right. When the government greatly invested in farming and the Dig for Victory campaign, Adrian Bell had the opportunity to go back to what he really wanted to go back to in, in 1943. He, he went to somewhere called Westall, which was actually in North Suffolk, and he worked on a farm called Brick Kiln Farm for six years. And on that farm, he would work with lots of prisoners of war, lots of land girls would be on that farm as well. And he really, really loved it. I think it was one of the happiest time of his yeah. life. Because the Second World War had the most tremendous impact on East Anglia, didn't it? I'm in the middle of reading his autobiography, um, My Own Master, and he talks about how, in fact, his first farm, is it Silver Lay, disappeared underneath an aerodrome, yes. because, of course, oh, East Anglia yeah. being flat. American aerodromes were built left, right and centre, basically. And he talks about quite a few other places that were changed out of all recognition because of the war, because you know, installations for aircraft were needed or, you know, whatever it might be. Yes, exactly. And, and he was also worried that if Germany were going to in, invade, then East Anglia would be one of the first places they'd come to. So, in fact, he sent his wife off to um, Westmoreland for a year and documents that time in a book called From Sunrise to Sunset. Have we talked about how he came to write this column for the Eastern Daily Press? No, we haven't. He took over from someone called Lilius Ryder Haggard, who wrote The Country Woman's Notebook from 1936 to ah. 1950. She was the daughter of Ryder Haggard. The adventure writer. Yes. King Solomon's Mines. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so she said in 1950 that she was all written out. Adrian Bell was approached by the Eastern Daily Press because he lived in Suffolk. They didn't think he'd say yes because at that point he was a bit of a name when it came to literature and they didn't think he'd write for a regional newspaper. But he said yes and he wrote for them for 30 years almost unbroken. And of course that was the time when regional press was bigger than it is now. I mean that was a big, substantial, mm -hmm. important newspaper, wasn't Very it? Very much. 
Yeah, it's still going strong, though. The newspaper itself is. I also found it so extraordinary the way he was able... His father got him the job, didn't he, of setting the cryptic crossword for the time. Yes. And the way he was able to do it in sort of something like 10 days or something, wasn't it? He was. Yes, he, he was. it was a necessity, really. He just moved back to Sudbury. This is just when he was writing uh, the trilogy. And his father said, well, you could earn this bread and butter money, really, every week if you do this crossword. There was a phenomenon in New York, I believe, there was a crossword, but there was none in the UK. So the Times thought, we need to have this. And he was approached, he wrote the first one, did one a week. Didn't he invent the notion of cryptic clues? Yes. Yes, which is the point, isn't it? I mean, there are crosswords and crosswords, but the cryptic crosswork, it is a whole other Mm. thing. Yeah. and and The amazing thing is, he went on doing them till 1978, so he must have done well over a thousand. Four thousand, nearly four thousand he did. Good Lord. He tells the story of when he was getting the train to London and he sees someone struggling with the Times crossword (laughs) opposite him. So he picks his paper up, completes it within a minute, and then puts it back down. That's so mean. (laughs) (laughs) For those of us who sweated over that crossword on occasion. (laughs) And whether that's true or not, no one really knows. But Martin Bell tells that story. His son, yeah, the the war correspondent and the politician, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was just amazing to me that he, he had such a sort of versatile mind, in a way, you know, that he could write so poetically, and yet he could do something like that. Yes, it is quite unusual. He, he actually very much disliked cryptic crosswords and he couldn't understand why oh. people would do them. But <laughs> he said, for some reason, my mind just works with those oblique references and everything else. Yes, it's lateral thinking, isn't it, really? But Richard, to sum up with his relevance today, do you see farming going back to something akin to to how it was when he first started farming? Yes, there's been some very positive moves of late, I think. You mentioned earlier about rewilding, um, move towards mixed farming, to have more diversity on farms, to ensure that we're not just degrading the soil. And there's, there's a lot of information now and encouragement for soil health, something that Bell mm. wrote about. In fact, he wrote The Flower in the Wheel back in 1949, which is a bit of a manifesto for the way that he felt there should be harmony between old methods of farming and new methods of farming he just wrote uh, towards the end of that i now have care of this soil which former men have cherished i feel such a compulsion to it it is the most important thing in this life for me far beyond the level of a paying proposition because i think it is the greatest parable of ultimate truth and he really felt as though we needed to take care of the land because if we take care of the land, then we can take care of each other. And, and I think we're starting to see a movement back from industrial agriculture towards these more traditional methods, which is great. Mm. Am I right in thinking that corduroy was taken off by soldiers in their kit bags during the Second War? Yes, yes. It was republished by Penguin. It was a little war edition. And when I was researching my first book, I got in touch with Anthea Bell, his daughter, who had all the archives from Adrian Bell's life. And I went over to Cambridge to see her. She translated Asterix. Indeed. Brilliantly, yeah. So whilst my wife was ordering the Asterix books in her spare room because they were all out of chronological order, I was looking <laughs> through this <laughs> this wonderful <laughs> chest of Adrian Bell delights that she had. And in that chest was, alongside an unpublished novel, wow. was all these war letters from soldiers, from prisoners from the battlefields or from prison camps. And he kept them all. And he, he wrote... Talking about the book? Yeah, talking about the book. And, wow. And he actually wrote an open letter in a, a magazine called Everybody's, which doesn't exist anymore. And this is Adrian Bell writing an open letter to all the soldiers. You wrote to me from Malta, from Malta pounded by air from Sicily, from North Africa, ringed by U-boats, all but cut off. You wrote to me, heavens know how your letter got through, that when the war was finished, you and your girl wanted to marry and have a little farm in England. You have a vision of England. Wherever you are, it has been your consolation and hope. Keep that vision, because it's true. It may be the key to your life. I am anxious you should know this, because if you follow your impulses and live your farming life with all its ups and downs, at the end of it you will sit back and recall that first vision of it that you have had in the desert of the jungle, and you will know then that all in all it was a true vision. That is remarkable, Mm, isn't it? Touching. Mm. 
I mean, rural writing was a thing, wasn't it, in the 20s and 30s and 40s and slightly beyond that, I think. This idea of intellectuals engaging with the land, quite a lot of them did actually go and try their hands at it, didn't they? And I, and I imagine quite a lot of them hightailed it back to London. But <laughs> he, um, he has endured in a way that a lot of that writing, we don't know any of it now, really, do we? Yeah, and I, I think it's a little bit in many ways like nature writers now. He was sort of writing in the tradition of rural writing, but that wasn't necessarily his influence. So he was more authentic wasn't he? I would argue he's more authentic. He lived the life in which he talks about and I think that's what makes him someone who is in some ways more of an historian as opposed to someone who writes literature and Martin Bell mm. his son regards him as an almost as an historian rather than a you know a creative literary fiction. Of course there are I mean there are a couple of, of people writing at the moment who farm aren't there I mean there's John Lewis Stemple who you know is a practicing farmer and and of course James Rebanks who um his most recent book English yeah. Pastoral which is as authentic as Adrian Bell and actually making much the same case for going back to traditional ways. In many ways, I think particularly James Rebanks is close to Adrian Bell as I think I've come across recently in terms yeah. of his outlook and, and the way that he expresses himself. Such an interesting discussion. Really interesting, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. Well, sorry, I went down a few cul-de-sacs, but you got me out of them. <laughs> Thanks. We always like that on, on, the, on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you just to sit tight and give us a book recommendation in a moment, Richard? Of course, yes. And just before we get to recommended reads, um, if you're curious to know more about the rural world that we've been talking about, that Adrian Bell lived in, I think, Gail, you've got a suggestion, haven't you? Yes, a, a friend recommended a rather wonderful website, which is called ruralmuseums.org.uk. And it's a, a network of museums in the UK aimed at promoting learning and encouraging wider understanding of Britain's rural heritage. And one of the many things it does is it allows curators of all the various collections to consult each other. It's a sort of, you know, discussion forum, really, for identifying bits of agricultural kit that they, they're puzzled by, for swapping, well, swapping knowledge, basically. But for the sort of general audience, it provides a rather wonderful map of all the rural museums in the UK. Right down in the south is Hampton Country Life Museum in Jersey, in the Channel Islands. And then it goes as far north as Shetland. In my area alone, there are three separate museums. There's the Dartmoor Prison Museum, which has a big collection of agricultural implements and scythes, farm wagons, hay turners. There's a museum of Dartmoor life, which um, has exhibitions on cider making and blacksmithing and the wool industry and quarrying and domestic life and farming. And then up in Mid-Devon, there's um, Tiverton has a, a museum which has displays of brewing and lace making and farming implements. And the website also lists various collections related to beekeeping, ploughs, shepherd's huts, dairying. So really, if you want to go and see a rural museum somewhere near you, you can find it on the website. You know, there are some fantastic places on it. It's a great resource, isn't it? I had a look at it and, and that map is excellent because, as you it say, is. it's got museums big and small literally across the entire yeah. country. Yeah. And the website was called ruralmuseums.org.uk. That's and right. And we'll, we'll put it in the show notes, won't we? Yeah. Now, book recommendations. Hazel, would you like to start us off? Right. Well, this is um, a book recommended to me by a friend, and I did wonder whether I should recommend it, really, because it's kind of full of bad language and carrying on. <laughs> um, but it is written by um, the wife of the Bishop of Sheffield, which I felt gave it a certain decency. Yes. Um, and uh, it's called Acts and Omissions. And she herself writes a blog called Fifty Shades of Purple. <laughs> As um, in Episcopal Purple, presumably. Yes, exactly. And this book is a sort of modern version of the Barchester Chronicles. Well, it's a whole series, in fact. And I realised that there is a whole sort of quiet fan club of this person called Catherine Fox. It's set in a, an imaginary diocese called Linchester, and it takes you through the sort of ecclesiastical year and ultimately the downfall of the bishop, who has a kind of secret. I think it was written in sort of 2014, at a time when the church was sort of wrestling with all kinds of things about sort of gay priests and gay marriage and so on. 
But anyway, all these various characters weave in and out, most of them ecclesiastical, like Bobuti, the suffragan bishop of Barker. Then there's also a university in the diocese called Poundstretcher University. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm really liking the sound of this, Hazel. <laughs> She's got a very, very authorial voice, and you either like it or don't like it. I think it's a kind of Marmite sort of book, you know. So it's not Trilopian in its style? Well, it's sort of slightly Trilopian in its style. I suppose there is a... The Barchester Chronicles have a kind of narrator, don't they? Anyway, the story weaves around the cathedral close and the carryings on, and I won't give away what actually happens to the bishop, but anyway, it's basically about the downfall of a bishop. And its I found it very funny. And the name again, um, Hazel? It's called Acts and Omissions, and it's the first in a, a series of the Linchester Chronicles by Catherine Fox. Thank you. Richard? So my recommendation is a writer I'm very fond of, someone called Walter Delamere, and this is uh, an anthology called Behold This Dreamer. And it was published in 1939. And he wrote a number of these very individualistic and acclaimed anthologies of poetry and prose for both adults and children. This one's primarily aimed at adults. But it has a book of two parts. And the first part is an introduction, a haunting introduction. It's called The Dreams and the Imagination. And he explores fantasies, hallucinations, interpretations of dreams, as well as descriptions that touch upon the process of going to sleep, awakening and, and such things. And he asks the question, does the imagination ever sleep? And uh-huh. part two of the anthology he's gathered together extracts from literature pertinent to dreams and he's gathered them over the course of his lifetime because by this point he was quite an old man. All the extracts and the poems that he's put together explore the nature of the imagination, the dreams and the unconscious, the depths beyond the soundings of reason. It's a a great book and a perfect book I think for uh, these dark winter nights. Yeah absolutely. Gail? Well, I want to recommend two books, if I may, by a young illustrator called William Grill. And these are books for children, I suppose, between the ages of seven and 11. And they're large format. They're in full colour. They are beautifully illustrated. The first one is called Shackleton's Journey, which was published in 2014, and it won the Kate Greenaway Medal. And it's an illustrated account of Shackleton's expedition in 1914 to across the South Polar continent of Antarctica. It deals with how Shackleton set up the expedition, how he raised funds and recruited people to join it. There's a wonderful page of drawings of all the crew, and there's another page full of the dogs. There were 69 dogs on this expedition. Beautiful illustrations of the ship, the Endurance. Lots of detail on equipment and supplies. And then he describes the extraordinary journey where they sailed south and the Endurance got iced in, ice bound, and then was crushed by the ice and they had to set up camp. And then as the ice began to melt, they had to make a dash for Elephant Island. And then Shackleton set sail for South Georgia in a small open boat, 800 miles, and they land on the wrong side of South Georgia. And to get to the whaling station to get help for the men back on Elephant Island, they have to cross South Georgia. They manage to do that and they get back and they do rescue all the men who've survived on Elephant Island. But for for children who are interested in history and and detail, it's glorious. And then the second one, which came out um, this year, is called Bandula, and that's a retelling of J.H. Williams' Elephant Bill. Williams went to work after the First World War for the Bombay Burma Trading Company, and he dealt in teak, and he learnt how to work with elephants. And so the book gives a very detailed account of how elephants are taught to work, who they're looked after by. In um, Burma, they were called Uzis, who were their trainers. William's a friend of an orphaned baby elephant called Bandula, hence the name of the book. And he sets up a school for elephants and a hospital. He and and Bandula form a very close bond. And then, of course, the, the war starts and the Japanese invade Burma. The elephants, Bandula included, are used for carrying supplies and weapons and building bridges and paths. And then in 1944, they have to evacuate to India. So an extraordinary expedition of 64 women and children, 53 elephants, 40 soldiers, 
90 Uzis and four British officers make the journey from northern Burma across absolutely impossible terrain to northern India in the most appalling climatic conditions. And at one point they come to a, a wall of rock and they actually hack a stairway for the elephants out of the rock and Bandula leads the elephants up to the top. Anyhow, they get there, they survive, but the book ends with quite a lot of detail on conservation of, of elephants today. And I suppose it's, it's a plea for the, the most extraordinary animals. And for any child interested in wild animals, it's just glorious. It's, everything about it is a joy. They sound spectacular, Gail. They are they fantastic. Really they really are. I, I just think they're, they're beautifully produced and um, I can't recommend them enough. Thank you, everyone. And a special thanks to Richard. We've so enjoyed having you with us, Richard. Thanks very much for um, ducking out of the classroom, as it were. Yes, you're, you're Richard, welcome. thank you very it's, much indeed. It's been a very nice diversion. <laughs> Is it back to the classroom now for you? Yes, I have to go and uh, run a, a school club now and then um, teach some poetry to year 10s this afternoon. Well, that that it could be fun. worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Now, this is the moment when I usually say uh, we'll be back next month, but we are ringing the changes this year. Yes, we've all loved making the podcast over the past three years, and it's been wonderful to know that they've been heard by over half a million people in uh, more than 80 countries all over the world. We've had a lot of fun doing them, and um, we've learned a lot, and we hope that you have too. And Thank you for helping make it such a success. Um, but as you probably know, we are a very small team and the podcasts do involve a surprisingly large amount of work and time for everyone. So this year we've decided to cut down from publishing one every month and instead to do a bumper podcast every three months. So we'll still be keeping t in touch with you and letting you know what's happening in Hoxton Square and we'll still be digging into all those lost and forgotten books. But we hope we'll also have a bit more time to work on the magazine and on the books that we're planning to issue. So the next podcast will be published on the 15th of April. And if you're signed up for our newsletter, you'll be given a reminder about that. If you're not signed up for the newsletter, you can do so on our website. Yes, and that way, of course, you get a reminder every single time. Um, and the podcast will come out on the 15th of July, October and January. In the meantime, please do explore the website at foxquarterly.com. On there, you'll find all the episodes, every single podcast was ever made, as well as all the Fox books and other good things to buy. And for subscribers, of course, there is the Quarterly magazine. The next issue is in March, and that subscription gives you access to the whole digital archive. So that's all the Quarterly magazines that Fox have ever printed right back to 2004. And I make that over five years of reading if you manage to get through about one a month. Not bad for £48. So if you'd like to sign up, please do visit the website, foxquarterly.com. As always, all the books and the writers that we mentioned today are on the show notes attached to the episode on your podcast app. Or if you like to listen through the website, and I know that quite a number of you do, you can find them all on there too. But once again, thank you very much for listening and for joining us for another literary trek off the beaten track. <laughs>